Welcome to the Radical Rotaries exhibit. Uh, hopefully maybe you've already seen it uh, before tonight if you came in and visited to see it since its opening, but if not, uh, this is our exhibit on rotary piston engines. And I, I, I want to make that very clear. You know, we're just saying rotary engine can be confusing because of course there were rotary engines that were rotary, rotary radial engines in aircraft and, and other vehicles. Um, so a radial engine that would actually, the entire engine spun around the crank. What we are talking about is the rotary piston engine, uh, often and most commonly referred to as the Wankel rotary engine. Uh, and you know, I, I decided to call the exhibit Radical Rotaries uh, for a number of reasons, right? Radical because it's, it's kind of fun and different and radical, but you know, radical also means that it's, it's something outside of the normal. It's, it's something that someone is questioning uh, you know, the, what the common uh, answer is, right? They have a radical idea, and that's what Felix Wankel had. So Felix Wankel, as a young man, actually himself told the story, he actually had a dream about a new type of engine that had this rotary piston inside of it that spun. And he worked for years, um, self-taught engineer, uh, on developing this type of new engine. And uh, you know, I, I like to think that every time I do an exhibit, uh, I like to learn something new, and I like to be able to share new information with our visitors at the museum and things like that. So one of the things I came across that often is not talked about is that the engine that we know today as the Wankel rotary engine is truly not Wankel's design. Uh, Wankel, of course, patents the rotary engine, but his engine actually had two spinning outer, uh, or two spinning major portions. So if everyone's familiar with the inside of a rotary engine, of course what we have is the, the rotary piston inside on the eccentric shaft spinning inside of that kind of figure eight combustion chamber, right? Well, in Felix Wankel's original patented design, that outer uh, combustion chamber shape actually spun as well. And NSU, who he was working with at the time, uh, who was really supporting Wankel's work on developing this engine and all of that, uh, they actually felt that that was too complex. So they brought in their own engineer. Forgive me, I do not speak German well. Michael is trying to teach me how to pronounce these words and I am working very hard at it. So the NSU brings in Hans Dieter Paschke and he actually develops the, the Wankel rotary engine we know to this day. So what Felix Wankel designs is actually called the Dreikobben motor and what uh, Paschke designs is the Kreiskoblen motor. And they both mean the same thing. They both mean rotary engine. But basically they gave, them, they gave the two engines those different monikers so they could distinguish be, between them inside of NSU. And uh, Felix Wankel's comment about this when he found out, because they did this without telling Wankel they were going to change his design, was, you've turned my racehorse into a plow mare because he felt that the design of their engine was less uh, acceptable uh, in engineering than what he had designed. But uh, NSU moved forward with that design, of course, still calling it the Wankel because he held the pat patent and they were just supporting what he was doing. Uh, so that is actually a little bit of the difference of what Wankel originally had planned for the rotary piston engine versus what we know today as the rotary uh, piston engine. So, uh, you know, as I say, I might refer to the DKM, which is Wankel's original two, uh, two kind of spinning component design, versus the uh, KKM, which is the one that is in every single vehicle that you see here inside the exhibit. Now, uh, the exhibit is by far not even close to an exhaustive exhibit on rotary powered vehicles, right? Rotary piston engine vehicles. There are a number missing, but the ones that are on exhibit are some of the, 
I would say, rarest and most unique of those vehicles, which of course is what we specialize in here at the museum. So I'm going to kind of do a walk around of the exhibit, not necessarily actually physically walking because they don't want me to move off camera, but uh, basically I will point at the cars that I'm talking about and give you guys a little backstory on these and uh, the importance of each of these vehicles within the exhibit. So uh, the first one obviously to talk about would be the NSU Spider. And uh, this is the first production Wankel rotary engined automobile brought to market. Now, I'm very specific about that because there was actually another company that prototyped a Wankel rotary engined car, but never brought it to market. And believe it or not, it was Czechoslovakian and it was Škoda. So Škoda built the 1000 MB and they prototyped it in the early 60s. It was introduced to production in 64, but there are actually photos and documents of a, a couple Škoda 1000 MB Wankel rotary engine cars. Uh, they didn't like uh, the power and, and there were a lot of issues they were having, so they elected to go with a standard internal combustion engine. But Škoda actually holds the kind of uh, honor of being the first company to experiment with that engine inside of a car. Uh, but, of course, as we know, NSU would bring out the Spider, often referred to as the Wankel Spider, uh, and be the first company to bring that to production for the world uh, to see in 1964. Now, interesting, if you look at the car, uh, you probably see some lines of the NSU prints, uh, which it does have those lines. They actually developed the styling of it off of the prints. Obviously, the prints was never a roadster, so you lose some of those lines going into the roadster uh, body style. But they brought it out and quickly started to understand, and this will be a common theme through the night, that there were a number of issues with rotary, Wankel's rotary design of engine, even in the new version they created of the KKM. So uh, production starts in 1964, lasts until 1967, and they only build a total of 2,181 units uh, for sale to the public. Uh, our Spider that you see here is a 1967, so last year of production. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I opened up the hoods tonight as well, so on some of the cars so you guys could see the engines, because that's what we're talking about. And, uh, but you'll see it is obviously a rear engine, rear wheel drive car. Um, that's actually kind of commonplace in the early rotary engine vehicles. Um, there are, are very few initially that are front engine, and oddly we have many of those here. Um, but it, it does hold that distinction of being the first production car to come out and introduce the world to this new Wankel rotary engine. So um, we're very lucky to have that here in the exhibit. And next to it, uh, the NSU Row 80. Uh, and this is another groundbreaking car in not only NSU history, but also in the rotor, uh, rotary piston engine world. So this was the first commercial use uh, of a developed twin rotor or two rotor engine. So the cool thing about rotary engines is the way they are designed, they can be stacked. Now what that means is you can take a single, one of the single rotors, put another one on top of it, another one on top of it, and keep stacking them and build a two, three, four, five, and so on and so on, so on rotary engine. Now, that, uh, the row 80 also is a front engine, front wheel drive configuration using a semi-automatic transmission. So if anybody's familiar with the row 80, uh, there's a very interesting you know, setup on the shifter so that when you actually put a little weight on it, there's a, a switch that actu actuates the clutch. There is no clutch pedal. You basically push down lightly on the, the shifter. It disengages the clutch. You shift into gear, let off, and it, it puts the clutch back into an engaged position. So, of course, never rest your hand on the row 80 shifter while you're driving or else you're going to need a new clutch. So, uh, but I also want to kind of break away from that for a minute because, you know, pointing out the fact that, you know, within this rotary exhibit, you know, vehicles like the Row 80, this is kind of what we're all about here. This is an extremely technologically advanced vehicle, uh, you know, in, in thinking about its engineering, 
and, and that's really what this exhibit is all about, kind of this idea of radical engineering. So um, I just think that's a fascinating part of what NSU was doing at the time, even bringing Felix Wankel on and, and encouraging him to develop the rotary engine the way he did. So, uh, you know, but again, the row 80, this isn't just, as I like to say, a blip on the radar. Um, this car was built from 1967 to 1977, th over 37,000 units, it was like 37,280 or something like that, uh, that were actually produced and sold to the public. And interestingly, it even survived the transition of Volkswagen uh, purchasing NSU and bringing that all into being part of Audi. So it, it actually survived. It is the last car branded as an NSU as well. Um, all other cars then started moving under the Volkswagen and Audi name. Um, so it's a very special car in rotary uh, history and NSU's history is kind of one of their last hurrahs and interestingly enough, using rotary power. So moving around, we also have a kindly on loan from a gentleman probably many of you know or have heard of, uh, Myron Vernus up in the Akron, Canton, Ohio area, has loaned us his Mazda Luce R130. And this, this car is very interesting in Mazda's history. Mazda is probably the most known automobile manufacturer for rotary engines, right? Famously the RX-7 and then eventually the RX-8, which became very popular, especially the RX-7, uh, even through the 90s. Uh, they were a very popular car. But if we look back in Mazda's history, uh, this was Mazda's only front engine, front wheel drive, rotary powered car uh, that they ever built. And it's actually very interesting to get into the history of it because this was really Mazda's foray into a luxury car market as well. So the decision to use a rotary engine moving into a luxury car market you know, um, was, was kind of an interesting idea they had. And so much so they wanted to make this car special, they actually went to the styling studio, studios of Bertonnet and none other than Giugiaro actually designed this car when he was a young man. This was one of Giugiaro's early, early uh, styling works within the Bertonnet uh, styling studio. So this car really brings a lot of great history together inside the exhibit and uh, is a very interesting moment in Mazda's history. Uh, but again, bringing that kind of common theme back in, uh, they quickly realized that there were a number of issues with uh, the seals, uh, what are called apex seals, inside of the Wankel rotary engine. Uh, they were somewhat inefficient engines. Uh, they would have you know, fuel efficiency problems. And so the car was produced only from 1969 to 1972, and they only built 976 units. So an extremely rare car, um, it being you know, less than 1,000 of them produced, and uh, you know, an interesting moment, as I say, in Mazda's history. And uh, we're very lucky to have that car uh, on exhibit and be able to see it. You'll probably notice if you look around it after the uh, uh, talk, there's also badges on it that say RX87. Uh, RX87 was the internal code for the car uh, inside the styling or the, the engineering and design studios. And uh, they actually elected to put that on the car along with the Luce R130 name. So the car almost has two different names to it, uh, interestingly. So, uh, but to move away from NSU and Mazda, Citroen was another company that got very, very interested in Wankel's design. Uh, now, of course, we're moving over to France and uh, looking at uh, how the rotary engine was applied uh, to the Citroëns uh, over in France. So uh, two, the two cars are kind of behind you right now that I'm gonna be referencing, uh, but the uh, M35, which is the gray car uh, here on my left, um, is kind of the, the prototype for the company. This is the first uh, car they bring out with the rotary engine 
and uh, they start experimenting with it. They make a big announcement. They're going to initially build 500 of these vehicles to kind of test out the theory and prototype the idea of having rotary power inside one of their vehicles. And uh, the, this starts in 1969. And as I say, initial plans to build 500, but guess what? They start figuring out that it, the engine's inefficient, that there's a number of warranty issues. People are bringing them back saying, the engine's wearing out, this is going wrong, the car's not running right. And they start to figure out that this isn't, this isn't quite engineered as it needs to be for us to be able to produce this car. So they actually start scaling back on the production of the M35, but attempting to trick the public and maybe the automotive media to look like they're still building 500, they actually start skipping serial numbers. So they get higher and higher serial numbers on M35s without actually producing all of those cars. Uh, they, in total, they actually only build just over half, 267 total M35s are produced uh, from 1969 to 1974, uh, or 19, uh, 72, 72, 73. In 74, they kill, they basically say, they tell everyone that owns one, your warranties are void. We will no longer warranty an M35. And at that point, they offered them to trade in the car. So a number of the cars got traded in. They were taken back to the factory and destroyed um, and, and do not exist anymore. It is believed that about 60 of those cars were never turned in. And uh, this is one of those 60, uh, and possibly still the only one in North America. I don't know of another one, but if anybody does, let me know. Uh, so it's, it's a very rare car, a very interesting moment in Citroen's history and uh, you know, their idea of moving to a rotary engine vehicle. Now, interestingly, again, we're talking about them figuring out that there are issues with the Wankel engine, killing the warranty on these cars for their uh, you know, customers, making them trade them in. But still in 1973, at the Frankfurt Auto Show, uh, what do they do but introduce the GS Birotor? So a two-rotor uh, engine vehicle and even though they had just gotten through all of the issues, actually were in the midst of all of the issues with the M35, they still attempt to bring out another car and uh, with a, a two rotor engine uh, in it. And interestingly as well with this car, uh, people started to wonder, the, the automotive media and even just the general public, they brought this out on the GS trim level or the, you know, the GS model of the company, which was a mid-level car. It wasn't the upper-level DS, and there were questions around that, but it was because, and what the general public didn't know, the DS was coming to the end of its life. So what this car was, was Citroen's attempt to basically bring out something new and different in the GS line that was likely going to possibly be a, a bit more of a, a replacement or placeholder for that DS level until they brought out uh, the next uh, car, higher level car. Uh, in total, uh, they only built 847 by rotors between 1973 and 1975. So you can figure out that, again, like the M35, these cars just, they really were not doing what they wanted them to do. And uh, it was stated many times that it was lucky if a by rotor made it to 20,000 miles without needing either major engine repair or a whole new engine. So you can imagine the warranty work on that was also a, a bit challenging for the company. So um, I'm gonna step away from the cars for a minute and we're gonna look at some of the, what I would call non-car, non let's call it non-automobile uh, parts of the exhibit as well. And uh, right in the middle of the exhibit here, we have the Croco. Uh, Croco is short for cross country. And uh, this vehicle was developed by a engineer named Walter Strom. And uh, he had ambitions of this being sold to the military. 
um, and, and, and not just you know, German military, French military, just the militaries in general, that this would be a new vehicle for militaries around the world that wanted to buy it and, and you know, produce this almost as a replacement maybe for something like the Jeep, something that was capable of off-road, cross-country, including water. This is an amphibious vehicle as well. It can go in water. Um, you'll even notice the tires say Croco on them. They are specially designed tires that work as paddles in the water, so they would actually be what is powering the vehicle as it's going through, along with uh, a prop shaft that went out the back. So they would spin as well as the, the propeller. Um, but in this vehicle, he chooses to use a rotary piston engine because of the compact nature of it. Okay? So you'll notice these engines, the, the engine bays that I have open, uh, especially in the NSU Wankel Spider, uh, you know, the engine is extremely low, compact, and there's actually a lid that goes over it still allowing you to have a trunk. If you had a standard internal combustion engine in that, of, you know, an inline four, V8, whatever, you would not have that trunk space. So another benefit of these rotary engines is their compact nature. So Strom decides to use the rotary engine. It's actually placed in an engine compartment below the two seats that you see there. Actually, it sits right below where you sit. Um, maybe an early version of a seat warmer. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's a very interesting vehicle, not only because he's using rotary, uh, you know, a, a rotary piston engine, but you'll also notice the way we have it parked. Uh, it's, it's actually... It does not have suspension, rather it has a pivot joint in the middle and it acts as its own suspension. So it's able to twist uh, on a three-point axis, uh, uh, like three-point suspension, to be able to go over pretty much any terrain uh, that it might find. However, what Mr. Strom figures out is that most militaries have no interest in this vehicle. Uh, not that it's bad, not that it doesn't go across country, but most people by this time are starting to figure out that the rotary engine has a number of issues. Uh, inefficient, uh, you know, fuel, it, it burns fuel quite frequently, you know, it uses a lot of fuel uh, as, it, as the seals wear out, burns a lot of oil, and the military doesn't want to deal with that, right? They want to be able to have a, a, high mi a higher mileage vehicle, something that's trustworthy and can get around, and they don't worry have to worry about constantly rebuilding an engine. So um, it really starts to kind of fizzle on uh, Strom and eventually the TAG group will buy this up. Now this isn't like TAG Hour of watches, things like that, but this is TAG group that is TAG Aviation and uh, some, uh, most people here might remember them from uh, the 80s and 90s when they sponsored F1 teams. There was the big TAG on the side of F1 cars that's the company we're referring to. And uh, they actually bought up the rights to build the Croco, hoping that they could make it go. And uh, they really found the same thing that Strom did, which is it really was not an idea that anyone wanted. They were able to sell some as recreational vehicles. There are still a few out there in existence. Uh, it's believed that maybe 50 survived today out of an unknown amount that were built. And, uh, you know, they're still seen kind of running around in some off-road scenes. Uh, but they were also developed later into a vehicle called the Rhino, which was a little better developed cross-country off-road vehicle. So, and then, check time here. Oh, we're doing good. Uh, behind me, I'm going to talk about these three uh, pieces, these three artifacts uh, last here. And I'm actually going to start on my right, I guess. And uh, this is our ski craft water ski tug. Uh, this was produced by the German company Ski Craft. And this is actually the world's first rotary powered vehicle of any kind. So they introduced the ski, ski craft tug in 1962. So uh, two years prior to NSU bringing out the Spider and even Skoda really experimenting with the 1000 MB. And uh, they do, they, they design this and build this looking at the compact nature of the rotary engine, okay? Uh, you can see how small this tug really is. I mean, you think about, you know, a, a ski boat that would have been pulling skiers, water skiers at the time. And, uh, you know, you had a very large boat, big engine. 
uh, this was one of the early personal watercraft, right? Not, not talking boats, but just single person, personal, going out, having fun. Uh, this is really one of those very first ones that come to market. And it's, you know, it's built in a way that you're supposed to be able to either handle it yourself or maybe with one other person. Uh, you'll notice if you look around the back of it, the, the prop shaft coming out the bottom. The entire rotary engine and prop shaft are actually on a hinge and they're latched down. So you can actually, you know, when you're transporting it or carrying it to the water, you actually have the engine folded up, no prop shaft sticking out, the bottom becomes perfectly flat so you don't scrape the prop on anything. And then when you get it to the water, pop the lid, drop the engine down so the prop shaft comes out the bottom and you're ready to go. Now, interestingly, this vehicle was actually not allowed in the United States for the first few years because most states that had water sports of any kind, uh, any nature that had, which is most states, right? We all have lakes and, and most of us are by, you know, either a lake or an ocean or something. But a lot of the laws in the marine world said that if you were water skiing, the vehicle that was towing you had to have a driver and a mirror or a driver and an observer that could see the person skiing so that if they were to fall down or when they were ready to let go and stop, you would know you don't keep going, you gotta go back and pick them up. So the way ski craft was able to finally work around this and get laws changed, is there's actually a kill switch on the handle. So there's a dead man switch and you would basically hold onto the handles, keep that button pushed down and uh, you know, the, throttle it and you'd be able to, to go around. There's great video online of these, one of these running. Uh, actually in period, and you steered basically just by you know, leaning, right? You just kind of lean the tug where you wanted it to go and it would you know, start kind of like a boat, you know, it just kind of turns. And uh, so with that dead man switch or kill switch, they were able to eventually get a lot of the laws rewritten to where that was acceptable because the tug would not keep going if you were to let go or fall off. So um, it's actually a very, very interesting idea uh, in using a rotary engine and really changed the idea of water sports uh, really around the world. Uh, you know, after this came, you know, personal water skis or uh, 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 what am I thinking of here? Jet skis, thank you. Uh, jet skis, things like that, that started becoming really a, a one person vehicle for water sports. Jumping over here, we have the Hercules uh, Wankel 2000, the W2000, and uh, this is the world's first rotary piston-powered motorcycle. Um, not a lot of those existed, <laughs> even the Wankel, the Hercules, but not a lot of people have built rotary piston-powered motorcycles. Again, going back to that common theme, they're just not quite as good as internal combustion. Uh, what is the saying? There's no replacement for displacement, right? I mean, is that, that's still fitting, I think. Um, so this was actually, Hercules introduced the W2000 at the Cologne Motorcycle Show in 1970. They had billed it as a production motorcycle in 1970. They were telling the public it was a production motorcycle, but their actual intention was to just see how people reacted to the idea of a rotary powered motorcycle. Evidently they felt that people uh, reacted positively enough to actually put it into production. Uh, it didn't hit production until 1974 though. Uh, they had to work out some bugs. There were a number of engine modifications between 1970 and 74 to make it uh, a little bit better running motorcycle. And, uh, but when they get it on the market and, and people start buying it, uh, they start realizing that it's slower than an internal combustion, you know, standard reciprocating engine uh, motorcycle. And it was also more expensive. They were, they were, the cost to produce this motorcycle was far more than it was to produce a standard internal combustion engine motorcycle. So people were getting a motorcycle in, in the same class that was slower and, and more costly than other motorcycles. So sales slumped, uh, people didn't really buy them. They tried to improve the engine over time, that didn't help. And even up until the very last year of production in 1976, the engine did not have a mixer in it. So for the oil 
and gas to be mixed to go into the rotary engine, uh, you actually had to, like a two-stroke, mix gasoline and motor oil in this. You didn't mix like a two-stroke oil, you mixed true motor oil into it to make sure it got the lubrication it needed. So not only was it slower, more costly, there was more thought that had to go into owning and operating one of these up until the final year of production. And uh, so between 1974 and 1976, they only built 1,834 of these motorcycles. So uh, again, a very interesting kind of piece in history of the rotary engine, and in this case, motorcycles. So the last piece I'll talk about, and I think I'm gonna nail the time for Rex. Uh, he was on me all day. Got to end at the right time. Uh, is the engine you see here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna slide this over if that's okay. It's not hooked up to anything, so everybody can see this. Um, yeah, we we kind of walked around the exhibit. Okay, you know we pretended to walk around. We you know we idea of walking around, and yeah, we talked about Germany, you know Japan, France, various different uh, locations around the world. But we never really talked about the U.S. except for changing laws to allow the ski craft in. The Wankel rotary engine was not only a European venture for automotive companies and manufacturers. Actually, here in the U.S., uh, the big three all experimented with rotary engines. Big three, of course, back in the day being Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors. And uh, we are fortunate to have on loan from uh, the National Corvette Museum uh, one of the GM RCE two rotor engines. So uh, General Motors may have been probably the most prolific in experimenting with the rotary engine. Uh, Ed Cole, who many of you may have heard his name, uh, Ed was a chief engineer at GM who worked up to being the head of the company. Uh, he was the president uh, of General Motors. And Ed truly believed that the rotary engine could be the way of the future. Um, he actually found it very interesting. He knew it needed work, uh, but he thought that GM might be the company that could figure it out. Uh, so they actually sent, uh, you know, acquired the license for the Wankel rotary engine, and uh, they were able to set up production to build GM rotary combustion engines. You can see this is a great example of a stacked rotary engine. You see the, the bare uh, metal sections here, these are the rotary, rotary housings, and uh, so they've got two stacked on top of each other. And uh, they actually experimented with this in a number of the vehicles um, that they were producing at the time, uh, but probably most famously the two that got m the most attention from the media would have been what were referred to as the two-rotor and four-rotor Corvettes. Uh, so they actually built two experimental Corvettes one having a four-rotor engine in it, and one having a two-rotor engine in it. And uh, they, they actually drove them around quite a bit, tested them quite a bit, tried their hardest to figure out how to make these engines work better and not need the attention that all of these other companies were figuring out uh, the rotary engine needed. And they, like everyone else, could not figure that problem out. Uh, so, in 1974, right after the two-rotor and four-rotor Corvettes are produced, Ed Cole gives in and says, we are no longer doing the rotary engine uh, project, and we are scrapping everything involved with that project. But uh, it is, again, kind of a, a, a unique moment in automotive history, even here in the U.S., uh, in that early 1970s period. And uh, you know, with even the big three experimenting with these Wankel engines, and you know, Ed Cole even thought that there might be a way to figure out how to make this engine more fuel efficient than the standard internal combustion engine, but he just could not figure it out. And this is this is from a man uh, that you know, I mean, respected Felix Wankel for what he did, but also the man that was able to figure out how to make an M16 not misfire in the jungles of Vietnam. Uh, you know, his mind worked in a way that very few engineers' minds worked. Uh, so I think it says a lot that, uh, that even Ed Cole and, and the teams here in the US um, couldn't quite figure out Wankel's design and how to make it better. But I think the open-ended question that is left that I'll leave everybody on 
is this wasn't truly Wankel's design. Wankel's design, of course, had the, the spinning combustion chamber as well. Had that been developed further, might the rotary engine have actually worked the way Wankel wanted it to, and could it have changed the idea of rotary engines and how we use them? Because now Mazda, although not using it as, uh, still using the KKM model with only a single spinning rotor, uh, is bringing the rotary engine back in their hybrids as the generating unit to charge the batteries. So now we're starting to play with the idea of the rotary engine being used as a generator rather than just the power source to power the vehicle. But I think it still would be very interesting to go back and look at Wankel's original design and how that might have worked uh, going forward rather than the KKM version with the single spinning rotor. So with that, I'll say thank you guys uh, for listening and uh, hopefully learning a little bit about the rotary engine that you might not have known. And, uh, you know, uh, for, because I'm, I'm, you know, a father of two very young children and I'm working on my dad jokes, uh, you know, feel free to take a spin around the exhibit. Uh, First, if you guys have any questions, this is the question and answer. Oh, yes, and, and there's time for a question and answer, uh, about 30 seconds. No. <laughs> okay, well, we'll start with Richard. We'll do it. We'll guys have any One of the most uh, noted cars was RX-7. Uh, Several of my friends had them. Uh, they loved the car. I mean, they loved the car. Why was it so successful and these others weren't? You know, that is a great question. Um, I think it, it developed a, a, a following of people that in, you know, enjoyed the car. And however, everyone I know, and I, I don't know, uh, you know the folks you know, I'm sure, um, everyone I know that had an RX-7 over time or an RX-8, still had the same complaints about the apex seals and uh, needing to rebuild the engine. Um, but I, I, I don't know what the intrigue of the RX-7 was because you know, it, it still had a lot of the issues. Granted, Mazda had kind of improved it a little bit, but you know, it still had a lot of the issues that all the rotaries had. I, I think it may have just been that they found a, a following out there that, um, maybe didn't care that they needed to put, you know, work into the engine every now and then to make sure it was running. The and the pack, yeah, I mean, the packaging was, yeah, I mean, it was a, just a great all-around car um, other than those, you know, issues, the, you know, rotary issues. Yeah. Uh, the original um, Wankel, uh, are there any prototype of the original that he designed or did it, was it all on paper only? No, there's, uh, there, he actually prototyped them. There's a great picture of him um, with one. The, the intro graphic has been held up in design and, and printing, but I have a, a picture of uh, Wankel with the um, original design on the intro panel, which hopefully will be in in the next week or two. Um, but as for if one still exists somewhere, I, I would have to believe it does uh, unless... Uh, uh, Volkswagen, after the merger, decided they'd just get rid of it. Uh, but that's, you know, that's something I didn't look into, whether or not there is an example of that original, um, you know, uh, see if I can pronounce it again, Dreikolbid motor, uh, DKM uh, version left in existence. That would be interesting to see and, and learn about. Yeah. But I'll, I'll look into that. Maybe by tomorrow I'll have an answer for you. Yeah, see if there's one still around. There's pictures of Wankel with the prototype. But, yeah, good question. Does it still exist, or was he so mad that he took it home with him and threw it away? You know, uh, I'll find out. Yeah. If Wankel was working for NSU and they modified his design, how did Skoda and say, Skicraft end up with functional rotaries before NSU seemed to have it in production? Yeah, so, well, Skoda, of course, he would have, he, they would have, he patented it in 1954. Um, and NSU had been, you know, uh, largely supporting him through the late 50s in developing it even further from the patent. So, and, and you know, repatenting versions and updates and those things. So, you know, 
all Wankel, all, you know, the reason we call it a Wankel engine, rotor engine, is because every company had to buy a license uh, for the Wankel patent. And part of that agreement was that the Wankel name would be in some way acknowledged that it was a Wankel rotary engine. So um, how Skoda even knew it existed, um, which, which version did they have in their car? Um, I don't know because there's literally one picture I've found and just a couple of references to them building the 1000 MP uh, or MB uh, with that engine in it. So it may have been the early uh, you know, DKM version and we just don't know because it appears that they didn't really document what they did or if they did, those documents are somewhere in Czechoslovakia and we don't know where they are. <laughs> so uh, my guess is they came across the patent and got interested and wanted to experiment with it. And of course, they were doing it in the early 60s, right around the same time NSU was developing this car. So, um, you know, a lot of companies talk. Yeah, and, you know, somebody at, at uh, Škoda may have known an engineer at NSU and word got around and they were like, ah, oh, let's give it a try over here in, in Czechoslovakia. So, yeah, good question and I wish I, I had more documents. It's, it's one of those, I, I find this when I develop exhibits or even if I just research a car, there's uh, what I always, well, one of my professors and, and I carry on, always like to call the technological rabbit hole. And you find some weird little mention of technology and all of a sudden you're over here and three days later, you haven't seen the sun and you're going, oh crap, I'm, I'm supposed to have something done. Um, and that's the thing. And, and I, I find it interesting here because, you know, studying the American automobile industry, it's pretty easy to chase things down. You know, you go to Detroit to the National Automotive History Collection or, you know, the Henry Ford or uh, reach out to the Smithsonian Collection or Revs Institute or something there, you're going to find, likely find that archive. Um, here, who do you call in Czechoslovakia uh, to start asking, you know, oh, I'm looking for the Škoda archives. Number one, they're not going to understand, probably understand English. Uh, you're going to have to find someone like one of our wonderful volunteers, Joanna, to help you talk to someone over there. And uh, then you're trying to figure out who holds automotive history in that obscure European country. So, um, yeah, these are the technological rabbit holes I hope to go down over the years I'm here. Uh, I'd like to point out I, I just passed a year here, so I'm, I'm still digging into those <laughs> stories. And to tack on to that, a lot of companies in Europe we have found, uh, depending on the, who still owns the company, there are no archives. There, there's nothing left. It, it, there is... There is no rabbit hole to go down, unlike the archives that were kept for the big three here in America. So it's just a, sometimes a cultural or a company difference. Hang on, Graf. I'll grab it to you, Graf. Do you ever drive an RX-7? No, uh, I've not driven an RX-7. I had the pleasure to drive a uh, first-generation Mazda Cosmo, though, um, and they are incredible cars. I remember driving an RX-7 and thinking it was very, very smooth. Like yes. if, if you were to build a, a two-liter six-cylinder engine, it had that kind of a small, smooth quality to it. Not overly torquey, but, but very pleasant. On the other hand, it got pretty dismal gas mileage. Yes, yeah, and that was, that was really, you know, kind of going back, I, I guess I should have mentioned, that was one of Wankel's, you know, thoughts with this after he had this dream was if you only have a couple spinning parts, you have a lot less vibration in the engine. You have a lot less you know, noise going on compared to those inline and, and V configuration engines you know, we have that are reciprocating and everything's moving around and shaking. And so you know, his, one of his hopes was to have that smoother quality um, inside the vehicles that he was hoping these engines would be in. And yeah, I, I agree, you know, in, in an early Cosmo, very smooth. Um, it's a little nerve wracking if you're used to internal combustion, unless you drive an F1 car, because you got to keep it almost at redline the whole time, every time you go to shift or else it really doesn't run well. Um, but yeah, it is, they are very smooth, um, but yeah, they, they drink the gas, so. I've gone down the rabbit hole several times of uh, wanting to own an RX-7 or RX-8 of some sort, 
and uh, I've driven a few of them as well. But one of the things that I was looking into with the RX-8s back when they were new um, was that it was said, and I could be wrong because I'm going off of old memories here, but you had to check the oil during every gas fill up and possibly add some oil to the engine at every fuel fill up. So as you can imagine, asking the you know, uh, you know, typical consumer yeah. to uh, pop the hood at the gas station, check the oil, go grab a, a quart of oil and add some to the car and recheck the oil. Um, that's probably, not everybody's gonna do that. So yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but I do yeah, remember yeah. reading about that. Actually, a good friend, uh, or a uh, good friend, a, a colleague of mine uh, that used to work at NCM as well, actually at the Motorsports Park side, um, was, it, he actually worked at a shop that specialized in in rebuilding rotary engines and and building them into race rotary you know, racing engines. There's a lot of guys that run them as race engines, um, and yeah, I mean, in in conversations with him, that was and and you know it goes into that seal issue. You know, the once the seals wear, uh, you're going to burn the oil. You're going to you know be constantly checking that oil level, adding more. So you know, in in the first couple years, you know, you might not have to do that as much, but, you know, when those apex seals start wearing out and, and some of the other seals, you're going to start burning oil. And that has been one of the long-standing issues with the rotary engine. Um, so, you know, there again, if we go back to that idea of that outer ring also spinning, does that reduce wear? Does that, you know, what was Wankel's thought there? Um, and I still have not found any, any write-ups by Felix Wankel um, on exactly why that outer section spun. Um, you know, was it for, was it how he was transferring power? Was it something to do with the seal? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to find that, so. Any other questions? Great, well, thank you very much, Derek. We appreciate you. Very informative. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And we'll see you at the next one in September. The next one will be our 20th anniversary. Um, I'll be leading a panel discussion with Jeff Lane, of course, and David Yando, our general manager, and Greg Costin, our restoration shop manager, talking about the early days and how all of this came to fruition and why. Uh, it'll be informative and fun and hope to keep it under uh, five hours. I'm kidding. There's like lots of questions. So. Um, thanks again. And a big, that's the yeah. next week, that's, the, that's a few weeks after that, is the big, big, big member dinner that yeah. you look out for that too as we get that planned and kind of catering all this stuff. So thanks again, guys. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you.